Hello, good day. This video gives an overview of performance evaluation concepts and techniques. The ex post analysis of investment performance stands as a prominent feature of modern investment management practice. Investing involves making decisions that have readily quantifiable consequences. An integral part of any decision-making process should be the evaluation of the decision. We are going to learn together how to evaluate the performance of portfolio managers. It is important to understand what caused the performance. Were there extra benefits from market timing or only extra transaction costs? Was stock selection superior? We are going to learn together. Stay tuned. In year 2001, the trustee of the Unilever Superannuation Fund sued Mercury Asset Management for £130 million. Unilever trustee sued Mercury for allegedly mismanaging a £1.2 billion fund that dramatically underperformed its peers in 1997 and early 1998. The suit is on the basis that Mercury Asset Management breached its contractual obligation to exercise the highest standard of care and expertise in its management of the Unilever Fund. Unilever trustee also asserted that Mercury Asset Management had negligently taken too much risk and mismanaged the fund. Unilever also claimed that Mercury Asset Management's lax internal controls allowed a fund manager to take excessive risks with its portfolio. In November 2001, Mary Lynn settled a $130 million negligence suit. The case, which highlighted the issue of whether fund management companies can be held responsible when their investment decisions turn out to be disastrously wrong. This has attracted huge interest from Britain pension fund industry. A win for Unilever could have opened the floodgates for similar cases against fund managers who make poor investment decisions. What is required of a portfolio manager? There are two desirable attributes of a portfolio manager's performance. First, the ability to derive above average return for a given risk. Second, the ability to diversify the portfolio completely to eliminate all unsystematic risks relative to the portfolio's benchmark. The ability of portfolio managers to meet various goals and objectives is important. Many portfolio managers appear to demonstrate superior performances during market boom years. However, when this performance is adjusted for risk, any perceived superiority may quickly vanish. How can we evaluate the performance of portfolio manager? It turns out that even average portfolio return is not as straightforward to measure as it might seem. In addition, adjusting average returns for risk present a host of other problems. There are several approaches. The issue is complicated by interim inflows and outflows that are outside the manager's control. The objective of this video is to provide an overview of performance evaluation concepts and techniques. At the end of this learning session, it is hoped that students will be able to explain how return is measured against risk, as well as apply the knowledge in evaluating performance of portfolio. What is the key difference between exposed and ex-ante returns? Exposed returns are realized or actual returns calculated using real-world historical data. Ex-ante returns are expected returns based on model and theoretical predictions. Performance measurement can be conducted in two ways. First, compare exposed return on a portfolio with exposed return on another portfolio. Second, compare exposed return on a portfolio with ex-ante returns predicted by some models. Let's start with learning some key concepts on performance evaluation. 
In the next few slides, we are going to learn about abnormal return, excess return, and alpha. These measurements of return sound quite similar. It is hoped that you will be able to know the difference after learning the concepts. Abnormal return is the difference between the stock's actual return and benchmark. It is the above average return that cannot be explained as compensation for added risk. The benchmark can be measured using several methodologies. We can use a broad market index or other stocks that match certain criteria, such as similar firm size, beta, recent performance, or ratio of price to book value per share. The benchmark can also be estimated using an asset pricing model, such as CAPM, Pharma, and French three-factor model. Abnormal returns can also be defined as the difference between exposed return and ex ante return. In the first equation, ART represents abnormal return. RT is an actual or exposed return. ERT is an expected return, which is ex ante. In the second equation, the expected return is estimated from CAPM. The third equation is incorrect as we cannot use expected market return to build a theoretical model. Let's try this question together. The ex ante return is 0.05% plus 0.8 times 1%, which gives us the value of 0.85%. The abnormal return will be 2% minus 0.85%, and the final answer is 1.15%. Although the term excess returns has many definitions, the one most commonly used is total return on a portfolio, capital appreciation plus dividend, minus the risk-free rate. Excess return represents returns over and above what could be earned on a riskless asset. Asset return is a security or portfolio return minus the risk-free rate. Let's try this question together. The answer will be 15% minus 1% and the final answer is 14%. Alpha is the difference between the fair and actually expected risk of return on a stock. Estimation of alpha must be made relative to a benchmark portfolio. Alpha is used to signify the amount of annual return on the portfolio that cannot be tied to the volatility in the overall market. Let's try this question together. According to the CAPM, the required rate of return for stock XYZ is 11% and 14% for stock ABC. Therefore, alpha for stock XYZ is 12% minus 11%. The answer is 1%. For stock ABC, the alpha is 13% minus 14%, which gives us an answer of negative 1%. Pharma and French conducted a study using data from 1934 to 2003. The portfolios are sorted into 10 groups based on size from smallest to largest. The blue bars represent average excess return and the red bars represent alpha. The findings from the research show that small cap stocks have higher excess return and alpha than large cap stocks. Next, we are going to learn two conventional performance evaluation tools, the time-weighted average rate of return and the dollar or money-weighted average rate of return. The time-weighted average rate of return can be divided into two types the arithmetic average and geometric average. The arithmetic return is the simple average of the yearly return. It is the sum of investment returns divided by number of periods. The geometric return is the compound annual rate of return. The geometric return is the end roots of the product 
of the holding period return for n years. In the case of a one-period investment, the return is the ending value plus income minus beginning value, and then divide by beginning value. We can use the one-period returns to calculate multi-period return using either the arithmetic mean or geometric mean formula. Let's have a quick exercise. The arithmetic mean is 10% plus 25% minus 20% plus 25%, then divide by 4. The answer is 10%. The geometry mean is 1.1 times 1.25 times 0.8 times 1.25, then use the answer to power of 1 per 4, then minus 1 from the answer. The final answer is 8.29%. From the answer, you can see that the geometric mean is lower than the arithmetic mean. An awareness of both methods of computing mean rates of return is important because most published accounts of long-run investment performance or descriptions of financial research will use both the arithmetic mean and geometric mean as measures of average historical returns. When rates of return are the same for all years, the geometric mean will be equal to the arithmetic mean. If the rates of return vary over the year, the geometric mean will always be lower than the arithmetic mean. The difference between the arithmetic mean and geometric mean will depend on the year-to-year -year changes in the rates of return. Large annual changes or high volatility will result in a greater difference between the arithmetic mean and geometric mean. Arithmetic and geometric means. So which one to use? When calculating past performance, the geometric mean is preferred. When predicting future returns from historical returns, arithmetic mean is preferred. Over a number of years, a single investment will likely give high rates of return during some years and low rates of return or even possibly negative returns during some years. We need a summary figure that indicates this investment rate of return we should expect to receive if we own this investment over an extended period of time. We can derive such a summary figure by computing the time-weighted or dollar-weighted returns. The time-weighted returns reflects the compound rate of return over a stated evaluation period of one unit of money initially invested in the account. Each return has an equal weight in the geometric average. For this reason, the geometric average is referred to as a time-weighted average. Dollar weighted return is the discount rate that sets the present value of a future set of cash flow equal to the investment's current value. It is also known as internal rate of return. Dollar weighted returns are weighted by the amount invested in each stock. This slide shows the formula to calculate the dollar or money weighted means. The money weighted rate of return measures the compound growth rate in the value of all funds invested in the account over the evaluation period. The money weighted mean goes by the name internal rate of return or IRR. Of importance for performance measurement, the money weighted means is the growth rate that will link the ending value of the account to its beginning value plus all intermediate cash flows. Let's have a quick exercise. Our objective in this example is to calculate the arithmetic mean and geometric mean return. Then we will calculate the dollar weighted return. I hope you will try first. This slide shows the final answer. I hope this will motivate you to try. In the Excel spreadsheet, I have listed the price and dividend per share for year 0, year 1, and year 2. This is the price in year 0, year 1, and year 2.
dividend is $2 per share for year one and year two. The cash flow here represents the amount invested in the stock. The investor buy the share in year one and year two and sell the share in year three. Negative means cash outflow. Positive means cash inflow. The cash flow are adjusted for dividend received. The return for period 1 is 53 plus 2 divided by 50 and minus 1. The return for period 2 will be 54 plus 2 divided by 53 and minus 1. The arithmetic return is obtained by adding the return for period 1 and period 2 and divide by 2. The geometric return is obtained by 1.1 times 1.0566, power of 1 per 2 and minus 1. The dollar weighted return can be calculated using the internal rate of return formula. All we need to do is highlight the cash flows. We can also draw some conclusion from the calculation. Before I end this session, I have a homework for you. This homework is quite similar to what we have just learned. The final answer is given as well. I hope this will motivate you to try. I hope you have learned something from this video. See you and goodbye.